when you study here you feel it's you know there is a lot to learn in that field and there is a lot which can come out of that field the student in iit madras has given the opportunity to consult with industries as well as do research work we also want to then start working on electric air taxis in about one or two years time here in iit the best thing is you can actually know whether you are passionate about this or not because you have the time and also opportunity to explore each and everything despite being a business student over here in iit madras the uniqueness over other b schools in uh, india is that i get to network over with the uh, people with other departments as well it is no wonder that in the last 5 years the major technology startups that have made headlines Madras has been privileged to host many international students from all over the world. Most of these students come for their exchange programs to either do their coursework, research work, or their thesis for a period of six months to one year. Thank you, Shivram. Thanks for the lovely video. Uh, good evening uh, and a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, we appreciate uh, you being uh, here with us today. Uh, as you all know, the IRS webinar series is gaining momentum in the public domain, and it has been attracting viewers day by day. Uh, the overall idea is to showcase the innovative research being generated to uh, various stakeholders like researchers, industrialists, and policymakers. And as a part of our commitment to the cause of fostering world class research iit madras has set up a number of research initiatives in diverse uh, fields of contemporary relevance uh, many of these initiatives will go on to become the centers of excellence within the iit madras system uh, and as we are here we are super excited to present the seventh webinar in the iris webinar series sensing and vision so this research initiative under the uh, sensing and vision technology cluster is led by professor uh, krishnan balasubramaniam <coughs> So, Professor Krishnan Balasubramaniam has been involved in the field of non-destructive evaluation for more than 36 years, with application in the fields of uh, maintenance, quality assurance, 
manufacturing and design so he is currently uh, an institute professor in the department of uh, mechanical engineering at iit madras and also serves as the head of the center for non destructive evaluation uh, which he founded back in 2001 so joining professor krishnan as speaker of today's webinar we also have professor prabhu rajagopal has also uh, joined as the moderator of this session so to uh, add a note that uh, professor prabhu has more than 18 years of experience in the field of uh, non destructive testing Uh, meta materials based imaging uh, bio inspired robotics etc and i also has been uh, the, in the department of mechanical engineering and the center for nde at iit madras since 2010 uh, it's my pleasure to in, to invite uh, you both to this session professors so over to you professor krishnan balasubramanian thank you i think prabhu will take over to start with so yeah thank you so much for the very kind introduction so uh, welcome all of you to this uh, Uh, indeed very exciting session on nde 5.0 uh, by professor krishnan balasubramanian so you had a very brief introduction from rudra murthy on professor krishnan professor krishnan uh, yeah he started sharing his screen so um, interestingly he is also my own professor so i was a student of iit madras and uh, professor krishnan was the advisor for for my final year masters project and that's how actually my journey into ndt started and um, i still remember the day when i met him that was summer of 2001 and i wanted to work on some uh, new sensing te uh, technique and he asked me to start exploring something known as the moi moiwa technique where we project a light on a surface and try to uh, map the surface profile using it so i've been in this area ever since uh, doing so many things together as well so professor krishnan doesn't need uh, any introduction to those within this field of nde he is uh, quite well known for his contributions uh, particularly this is his profile he did his phd from uh, drexel university uh, in usa obtaining his phd in, in uh, way back in 89 and his uh, phd supervisor was professor joe rose who is one of the authors of uh, this classical textbook on guided wave technology then uh, he went on to become an academic in the us itself going on to become an associate professor at michigan state university he joined iit uh, madras uh, in 2000 so just uh, the summer before i met him and uh, later you know he has made uh, all these contributions to the ndt community which is recognized both nationally as well as internationally so he holds multiple fellowships of uh, prestigious bodies including the indian national academy of engineering national academy of sciences he his work has been recognized through the roy sharp prize by the british institute of ndt and he is also the winner of the national ndt award by the indian society for non destructive testing a few years ago in recognition of his widespread contribution to technology development in the strategic sector the drdo awarded him uh, the their highest award the uh, drdo academy excellence award and uh, more recently he uh, has been recipient of the prestigious abdul kalam national technology innovation award again recognizing his contributions for both uh, in academia as well as in technology translation and uh, he is recipient of iit madras's highest recognition which is the lifetime research award so he is a uh, um, associate editor of a number of international journals currently with ndt and e but earlier with ultrasonics and also the journal of the indian society for ndt so with those words it gives me great joy and pride to welcome professor krishnan the floor is yours sir please uh, share with us your wisdom on this you know fascinating and exciting topic of nde 5.0 thank you thank you prabhu thank you rudra and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be giving this talk as webinar uh, so what i want to talk today is something that uh, i call it as nde 5.0 and uh, this is talking about what are the new horizons in the area of non destructive testing asset integrity monitoring and structural monitoring i understand that the audience is, has a variety of background so i will try to make it as simple as i can uh, i just wanted to put on record here and recognize the immense contribution over the years uh last 20 years of the various masters phd students undergraduate students 
uh, project scientists who have all put uh, their heart and soul into making our center a fairly well-recognized center worldwide. And for a lot of the contributions that we hold uh, very close to our heart. Uh, there is a website, cnd.in, which does have some information on uh, what we do. Uh, with that background, let me go forward. So the question is, what do we do? So we evaluate materials and structures, particularly of the engineering kind. So you, whether you are traveling by road, we are traveling by air, we're traveling by a train, whether you are right next to uh, a, a oil and gas industry or a chemical industry, or you're far away from a nuclear industry, or you ever wondered how the power gets to you, uh, which turns on your light and uh, fan, Every one of those have very deep engineered industrial assets that are behind it. Now, the, whether it is during manufacture where a quality control is very critical, whether it's automotive component to a pipe to a plane or an engine of a plane, or whether we look at how this components when they're used actually start to degrade like just like a human body you know becomes old materials also become old there are many many reasons why they get old now just like the human body we also would want early warning we want to know well before something happens we don't want to know after it has happened because then sometimes it's not always uh, the best of situations so we want to do take some proactive uh, steps so that we can avoid untoward actions. In an industry which is operating, the untoward uh, or the early uh, warning will provide them to take proactive action so that they don't have a sudden, uh, you know, what they call a shutdown and, and they lose a lot of uh, productivity. If it's a quality control uh, in a manufacturing environment, you do not want too many rejections because every time you reject a part, it's money down the drain. So you also want to do it just the way we do it with human bodies. You do not want in any way to decrease your performance. So for instance, if you want to find something wrong with, uh, with uh, you go to a doctor, the go doctor puts a stethoscope on you, the doctor puts, uh, asks you to take an ECG, or he may also ask you to take an ultrasound or an X-ray. The idea here is that you find out what's inside your human anatomy but without in any way, hopefully you can just walk out of that without too much trouble. Okay? And so that you, it doesn't affect your performance. That's exactly what we want to do with engineering structures. If you want to, again, go to a shutdown, you want to cut something, uh, in, like just the way, you know, you don't want a biopsy if possible. And more importantly, you don't definitely don't want to cut open, uh, you know, and see how we can do that. Uh, without uh, in any way decreasing performance. So this is exactly what we want to do. And so the methods that are used, we call them as non-destructive or non-invasive methods. And this is very much used in the industry. There is not an industry, there's not anything that you are using today, right from the laptop to your cell phone, to the chair you're sitting, to the car you're driving, to the train or the plane you're going to be taking, which does not use non-destructive testing at some point or the other, in fact, often multiple times. And actually, if you look at carefully, these techniques that we have developed or we are working on can actually take a material right from the time it becomes a material all the way to become a component and all the way uh, to uh, when the material actually fails, we still can use these technologies to find out what went wrong. So, Essentially, that summarizes what is in this slide here. It says that uh, whether it's raw materials, whether it's manufacturing, or whenever the component is in service, it's certainly a value. And we do a qualification of raw materials through a non-destructive evaluation. We actually look at quality assurance through manufacture, during manufacturing. The manufacturing can be primary manufacturing to secondary to tertiary manufacturing or even post-assembly. And in service, as a, uh, you can see this little cartoon here where the guy is sitting on a pipe on a valley. The pipe goes from one end of the valley to the other end. 
uh, and the guy is probably a, uh, with a thousand feet drop uh, below him, has to figure out whether the pipe is not go is going to survive the next two three years of service. So as I earlier mentioned, a lot of what you, every one of us have experienced in the form of medical diagnostics, uh, whether it's x-rays, whether it's ultrasound, whether it's infrared imaging, even a stethoscope. These are all non-invasive or non-destructive technologies that are used to find something about the human anatomy and the state of the health of the human body. Very much so, in the case of non-destructive evaluation, we have radiography testing instead of X-ray imaging. We, we just call them by different names. The way we employ them is a little different. The inferences are absolutely different, but the physics is very similar. So in many of the technologies that are used in the medical field that you and I have experienced fairly regularly in our life is exactly what we do, but except that Instead of a human anatomy, for us, we look at engineered components, engineered structures. Now, if that is the case, then I might start to think that, hey, this is a fairly simple problem. All I need to do is to go to a doctor and find out whether my car is all right or not. Interestingly, as much as I, as an NDE person, cannot figure out what is there in a human anatomy x-ray. Same is probably true otherwise for a doctor, that they will not have uh, any clue as to what an x-ray image of a weld, which is shown here, uh, means uh, for the real uh, performance. So there is a big difference. While the physics is similar, the technologies have a lot of similarities and a lot of cross-pollination and cross-learnings, it's a big difference. Especially in the fact that human anatomy has not changed in the last uh, you know, few hundred centuries. So that way the problem definitions have not changed. Yes, there is probably newer findings and newer things that we learn, but essentially you are talking about human anatomy that stayed the same over centuries, uh, well beyond what technology is known. Now, contrary to that, we are going to talk in terms of uh, myriad problems that we face in the in engineering industry. You have so many complicated geometries. You have so many different problems, whether it's an airplane to bridges, to dams, to railway bridges, to a uh, power plant. It's very different. Each problem is very different. Even within a single plant, you take this bridge that I'm showing you here, you have to worry about every cable that is holding the bridge together. You have to worry about the deck that actually is holding the, uh, I've been held by these uh, 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 cables. You have to worry about the pillars are on, on either side that are holding the whole bridge together. You got to worry about the soil underneath this. And so the number of variety of problems that we deal with is significantly higher. And more adding to that challenge is the fact that you have new materials is coming out probably every couple of years. Everybody wants to design new cars, new uh, vehicles, new uh, bridges. So then what? just about the time when you think that you have solved a problem, a new problem appears. Large volume of materials to be looked at. A bridge, for instance, is so big. So how do you manage to go and look at, and we are looking for probably cracks that are of the order of uh, three millimeters, four millimeters. A crack of four millimeters is not accepted in a rail track. If you just look at how much rail track are there in India, you're talking of nothing less than probably 200,000 kilometers of rail tracks. And each rail track has two rails built. And some of them have more, more than that. So you're not, you're, so you're it's almost to a point where you feel like you're challenged by a needle in the haystack uh, paradigm. Now you're going to add a little bit more uh, uh, challenge to that is accessibility. How do I go to this bridge and go under the deck and be able to figure it out? Or how do I go to the pillar that is probably in 
uh, 50 feet, uh, feet of water and go underneath that and see how, what is the condition. In fact, most of them will have so much biofouling and coatings and algae and so forth that you probably have tough time even seeing what is there, leave alone finding out what's inside. You go to a nuclear industry, you go to a process industry like a refinery, you're dealing with temperatures that are uh, 1000 degrees Celsius, uh, sometimes much more. How do I find what's uh, happening inside? Is my furnace okay? Or suddenly something wrong can go on it. What about nuclear environment? What about uh, you know chemical environment? And finally, the biggest challenge is to do it all at a cost point that is going to be affordable because uh, every industry uh, bottom line uh, is dictated by cost. And so cost effective solutions are important. So this is a, these are the challenges that you add to technology that you have to deal with when we are dealing with this. So we have a lot of different methods of doing, uh, uh, handling these challenges. We have systems that are implemented in the sh inspection shop floor. You have post-manufacturing handheld instrument that go and try to do inspection. You have robotics, lots of robotics. In fact, I'll show you a couple of videos in a minute. And then of course, more so in uh, today's world where COVID has limited our access to infrastructure, where travel and uh, you know, uh, access is uh, an issue, more and more people are looking at how do I instrument the uh, components and structures and try to remotely diagnose what's going on uh, so that I can avoid travel, I can avoid interactions. Some examples are shown here. So here's an example of one of our uh, startups looking at a biofouled uh, metallic uh, pile under the ocean using a very interesting technique called as pulse steady current. And look, at it has got to go through all the biofouling to be able to measure the wall thickness and remaining wall thickness so that the pile can be allowed to continue to operate. Another example is here where when you can see a robot that is traveling in a very large shell structure. And finally, you also have a very good example of a robot. This robot actually is a drone-based robot which have an ultrasonic sensor that is measuring the wall thickness of this large structure in order to avoid uh, any uh, you know, creation of scaffolding and be able to do it quickly and safely. All uh, products of some of the startups of IIT Madras over the last five years. So that comes to the mission of our center and our research. We are looking at creating deep research concepts in the area of non-destructive te evaluation technologies with a goal that we want to provide improved performance to the industry of their assets and their components and their processes, improve safety, reduce casualties, reduce even probability of casualties, and finally increase the life of these components so that we live in a sustainable world. This is our mission. With me in this mission are my colleagues, Prabhu, you already heard from Kavita, from engineering designs, Krishnamurti from physics, Balaji from electrical, Manu Santanam from civil, Rama Prabhu from physics, and Tiju Thomas from material science. We are a very good multidisciplinary team. Uh, that, uh, uh, and some of the work that I'm gonna highlight in this talk will definitely uh, be from uh, contribution from all of them. Uh, so what do we do uh, in this particular center? We actually look at non-destructive imaging and evaluation methods, how to do it better, how to do it cheaper, how to do it in a way by which it becomes more feasible and more affordable. And also to look at how do we do it in very hostile and difficult conditions. Now, just like the way we are now able to take a, a, a small little uh, IoT uh, device and put it on your arm and be able to monitor the blood sugar on a regular basis, 
we all can do the same thing. We can use the same technology, put it on bridges, we can put it on aircraft, start to make measurements quite like this is called structural health monitoring. And more and more today, that's becoming very popular. Finally, we can also try to make measurements in very hostile uh, temperatures so that we can start to improve the performance of these. So we work in all the three domains and we use acoustics or ultrasonics and electromagnetic spectrum in this entirety to this end. So we have different faculty working in different uh, part of the spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum that you learned in high school physics going all the way from light to X-rays to gamma rays, uh, in between you have microwaves and so forth, the entire spectrum we work on. One of the ways by which we actually take this technology and provide it to the industry, and not the only way, we also do a lot of technology transfers, but we also find it very convenient for our students to be able to start companies, startup companies, and IIT Madras has a very live ecosystem. I think you already heard that in the starting videos, wherein we have been very successful in incubating over the last 10 years, more than 10 companies, 10 startups. These startups today employ uh, more than 500 people. Most of the jobs are high-tech jobs. Today, the valuation is of the order of 100 plus million dollars. And these uh, companies have generated more than 60 IPs over the last five to six years. And so they're very proud of uh, the accomplishments. And you may see a little bit of uh, that during my talk. You've already seen a couple of videos on them, from them. And one of the things that we want to be is globally relevant. So while we have significant presence within India, we also have very active partnerships with our other uh, partners around the globe, particularly in Europe and the US. Uh, the, everything that you see in the star are our academic uh, partnerships, uh, whether it's student exchange, special student exchange, uh, joint projects, joint programs, faculty exchanges, uh, doing things together. We have been very successful. But not only with academic partners, uh, a lot of uh, what we do with industries outside, including a lot of our startups that are listed here, certainly makes us very proud that we are fairly global in our exposure. And our goal over the next five to 10 years is to go make sure that we leave very few gaps in between. So we really have some areas where we want to look at and expand and see if they are to build partnerships in other regions also. So when I come and say, I'm looking at ND 5.0, I need to let you know, what do I mean by that? So like industry 4.0, that is quite popular uh, in the industrial uh, parlay. We also talk of a very similar parlay in ND, which has very similar connotation. So ND 4.0 is where an offshoot of ND, uh, industry 4.0, but only relating to the field of non-destructive evaluation. So what that means is that over the years, so in the mid 60s and 70s, we wanted to standardize and make sure that the procedures were exactly the same, whether this inspection is done in India or US or China. We started developing, uh, computers became somewhat uh, available in the 70s. So then computerization started. You, had, you, you could develop newer technologies, better technologies. So over the 70s, 80s, and 90s, computers became, and automation became uh, the, uh, you know, the buzzword. Of course, in the last 10 years or so, we are moving away from just computers to IOTs, robotics, edge computing, all that is uh, something that we are doing today. And to some extent, we are still, uh, and we continue to do that. And I suspect over the, for the next five to 10 years, we still will be doing ND 4.0. So then the question is, uh, what next? So in, uh, that's what we want to explore today at I, and our team of uh, eight fa uh, faculty members together want to explore what can be the future for ND. What can we do better? 
and what can we do very differently. So we have identified these uh, five topics, which is the first one being what I call ubiquitous sensing, which means that just like, you know, if I ask you a simple question, how many sensors are there in your human body? I don't think we have a clear answer to that because there are so many. These are tiny sensors built all over the place. I think the next future for ND 5.0 will be to go towards that. Can we make miniaturized sensors? Can we make them in hundreds and thousands? All of them talking to each other if possible, but definitely talking to your brain. The brain being something else. So we'll talk about the brain in a minute. Another area that we are focusing on uh, already was kind of alluded to earlier is, can I improve and push the envelope on information, particularly imaging? We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute or two. Another area that we have focused on is what I call as edge intelligence. Now we already know edge computing. Edge computing is now becoming the order of the day. Now today, edge computing is uh, uh, looking at implementing the human uh, inferences that have been, that uses many information to come to that conclusion as to what action should we do, but it's all pre-done and then it is ported. Then future, and I'll show you some examples, will be that we will be doing live calculation at the edge, which means I'll be doing very complicated. So what can I put a sensor that will actually measure the first part of the wave before the tsunami wave hits you? So there is usually a eight seconds to 10 seconds between the first uh, information and the actual damage that can cause. That is eight seconds that, can I do enough calculations so that I can tell exactly what's gonna happen and what I should do? Can I do that at the edge? So can I uh, figure a way to do that? I'll show you some examples of how maybe that is possible. And then we need to also look at wide area uh, inspection and also look at remote and what I call a pervasive infection, a swarm of robots, tiny robots. I'll show you some very initial examples of all that as we go along. So the first example is what I call ubiquitous sensing. We need to do the sensing in a way where sensors are democratized. So today, if you take a, I, I'm just showing one example here. So here's a high temperature process that you see on the top. Today, if you look at it, they probably will put a few sensors and make certain measurements. Our goal is to make sure that we can put hundreds of sensors here. These sensors have to take the temperature and the hostile environment. They also have to provide information and the cost of getting the information has to be very low. So we are already working on many technologies which will, be, which will be able to do these things. That includes even nanomaterials, nanomaterials that can coat uh, fibers, we can coat materials and then they, then that becomes uh, sensors. Some of them are like uh, a paint that acts like a skin. So a lot of what we have sensors in the human body is skin. Maybe can we create artificial skins for these engineered components? These are examples of where we would like ND 4.0 to take. I think some of them may be many years down the road, but some of them may happen in the next five to 10 years. Another example is an example where structural health monitoring using fiber optics is well known. It's been used and talked about for the last 20, 30 years, 40 years. And there are many cases when bridges are being instrumented with fiber optics and we are making some measurements. In all of them, uh, the question is, can we do better? Can we do again in a more ubiquitous manner? So we are now talking in terms of passive sensing using fiber optic sensors and uh, uh, ultrasonic information. So the idea here is not to have active uh, excitation, but to use excitation that's already happening in naturally so that we can try to understand the state of my structure. And to do that, 
I need to make sure that I have a baseline. And so what we do in this passive sensing, and this is uh, some, uh, this, we are not the only one working on this, is to make sure that we, instead of measuring absolute values, we start to measure differential values, but also take into account that this is, gets done in a time scale that makes it relevant. So, uh, so apologize for putting an integral equation here, but that tells you that if I measure something at point A, and measure this and a similar information at point B. And I don't now know, you need to know what is the source of the information, but I can decipher what is the state of a material using this expression. So this is a very simple example of work that uh, we can do. Pushing the limits of imaging is something that uh, we have been working on in the center for quite some few years. In fact, I think in certain domains, probably we are ahead of uh, everybody else. And one area that we're working on is ultrasonic imaging. So as you know very well, there is something called a Rayleigh criterion of for imaging, which means that, and this is well known over centuries and everybody in optics will uh, you know, understand that. Uh, so will be anybody in the acoustics regime. You cannot resolve anything that is below uh, half a wavelength. So in other words, in order to resolve smaller and smaller objects, you need to go higher and higher in frequency or smaller and smaller in wavelength. But then that has its own difficulties. So then how do you optimize it? How uh, is there a way by which we can break this uh, uh, Rayleigh criterion? So over the years, uh, we've been working on this. And one of the ways by which we're working on this is by using a technology called metamaterials. And they're using uh, the physics of evanescent waves. And it's a well-known fact that evanescent waves actually have this information beyond the Rayleigh criterion. However, we have always failed to harness that. And one way to harness that is by putting what is called a, a metamaterial, which actually propagates that information to where we can do quantitative machine. So here's an example. There's a small defect, and the defect in this case is uh, lambda by seven, which means one by seventh of wavelength. As I mentioned, the Rayleigh criterion for imaging is lambda by two. So we already three and a half times better than lambda by two. And the question is, can I image? So here's an example. Here's an image of a line, an image of that defect without the metamaterial, which is in blue color, what you see is you can detect it, but I can't size it. I can't, it's so it's like, uh, you know, take off my glasses and I can see there's a writing, but I can't read it. That's exactly what you have in the blue color. Now, what I'm doing is I'm now just, no, nothing different. Absolutely everything is the same. I just introduce this metamaterial in between and do the same scan line scan across and suddenly I see the two edges. You see the edge one here and the edge two here clearly telling me that I can resolve the two edges, which means I can resolve the size of that. And this gray area is the actual size that we are hoping to uh, resolve. Now, that means I'm doing three and a half times the limit of physics already. Question is, where does this go? This is done, this is something we did probably four or five years ago. Since then, 2017, we showed lambda by 25. 18, lambda by 36. 2020, and mind you, this is a cover page of uh, the Advanced uh, Physics uh, Journal of, of uh, American Institute of Physics, lambda by 72. So, by ND 5.0, we hope that this number will add a couple of zeros to it, wherein we will be in a new paradigm of imaging, which will change what details we can get out of an image. Another area that we wanna push, which I talked about edge intelligence, is in how do we push computation? Today, computation is done in engineering using techniques like finite element analysis finite difference analysis, finite volume analysis, where we take a large problem, break it into very tiny elements, make some assumptions on their element, simplify the physics of each element, then calculate at each element level, but then 
say that they are all connected in some fashion, and then we try to uh, see how the end result comes up. So that if I take a small uh, wall and say, hey, I am heating one side of the wall, what is the temperature on the other side of the wall? I break the wall into very tiny particles, maybe half a millimeter by half a millimeter, by half a millimeter, and do my calculations. This is a very intensive calculation. We use very nice uh, formula that you probably have seen in engineering, like the Navier-Stokes equations and stuff like that. Very expensive to do in terms of computation. Takes a lot of time, takes sometimes days to do one e calculation for one problem set sometimes. Definitely hours in many cases. Definitely boring and tedious. Is there a way around this? Can we simplify this? Now, this is where everybody uh, talks, uh, the buzzword of today, AI comes into picture. Wherein it is possible to actually move a uh, train AI engines to do these calculations and they can do it very much, a lot faster. And they can also do it in very small computational uh, processors like even a cell phone or a palm top because you have reduced a very complicated partial differential equation like Navier-Stokes into something which is simply a linear algebra equation. Then the question that comes up is, have I lost the physics in it? AI is, uh, you know, training. Uh, it's more of a patent recognition, you know. Have you lost the physics? The answer is probably not. The way we do that is by doing similar calculations like what I showed you earlier, the boring, long, tedious calculations. Use a lot of the calculations that have already been done over the years. Use that and do more calculations, but then keep it away from the actual end use. So do it in your large central process, just the way Google does it. When I go and search for something, you get it instantaneously. But then Google has done a lot of homework on the back end. So do many of the AI engines that you use on a daily basis. So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll back end it. And it most probably will be a one-time effort. But can we push the envelope? Can we push the envelope? Make the end user have the experience of instant calculations, very deep calculations, but have it instantaneously, have it on their palm top or on your edge computer hardware. That is the question. Now this, this to me is exciting. An example here, this is a very uh, recent work by a student of mine. All we are doing is a simple, if I take a pebble and drop it on a pond, you know that an, a wave will travel spherically. On the left-hand side, I've used finite elements to calculate it on a very nominal laptop, a very, very simple, very cheap laptop. So it takes a little extra time to do that. Now, on the right-hand side is an AI engine that is going to show you the same physics. And you see the time difference. It, this is left has taken about 45 minutes. The right, second, the one on the right is 65 seconds only. So you're talking of a couple of items or orders of improvement. Now let's watch this. So here's a pebble I've dropped. And on the left is the conventional numerical approach. The right is the AI-based approach, deep AI as I call it. DPA. Can I extrapolate it to more pebbles? I'm dropping five pebbles. And the reason why I'm talking about this pebble is these pebbles in acoustics or ultrasonics, we call them as point sources. And often these point sources are building blocks. Now, if I have point sources, I told you, right, uh, you build, uh, you take a complex problem, break it into tiny elements. So these are fundamental building blocks of an acoustic model. So I can now take this and create a very nice acoustic calculation the way I want it. Now, what can I do with all these kinds of things? I can start to do, change my information content. Instead of measuring, uh, how can I uh, extrapolate my information? So if I measure, say, in this case, if we are, what we are showing is when my ubiquitous sensing happens in one side of a uh, pipe, can I estimate what is the temperature on the other side? Now, for me to take this sensor and put it on the other side will not be easy because the temperature difference between the one side and the other side can be 500 degrees. 
So it's a lot easier for me to measure on one side and be able to, can I use the physics of the problem and, and use edge computing and live measure what is the uh, temperature on the other side? And more importantly, can I tell the guy who is in the, in the hot seat, hey, now you, all you need to do is to change the valve by some number, and then this problem that you're having will get solved. You need computation. Today, you have to go back to the uh, engineers who are sitting remotely. They have to do the computation, may take three days before they get back an answer to you. The alternate would be that you have some rule of thumb, uh, which you will try to use it. But now we are talking of computers at the edge, working live and trying to make a difference. Here's another example. Welding is one of the most common engineering uh, processes. And today, people are using multiple sensors. You know, so multi-fusion, data fusion is very common. So you have laser profiling, you have uh, CCD cameras, you have infrared cameras, all looking at this weld and trying to see, is my weld all right or not? Because if I mess up my weld, it's too expensive for me to do something different, to correct it. So the question is, today I can definitely have the technology, and again, AI is used here, to be able to tell that something is not going right. Some of the parameters are off. But more importantly, for me, I need to find out what should I do so that I bring everything back to the right parameters. How do I make sure that I have live calculations that correct the issues that are making this weld go wrong and put it back together? So there, again, we will use multiple AIs here, wherein there'll be a diagnostic AI, and there'll also be an intervention AI and they will start to talk to each other, create what if conditions, but it's gotta be done so quickly. That is where the quick computation that we are pushing the envelope on comes into picture. We need to do this at microsecond to millisecond levels so that before the weld moves a millimeter, we know exactly what to correct. Maybe the current has to be changed. Maybe the speed has to slow down or fast, fa go faster. This has to be done. So we are talking of taking the sensor information and processing it with the knowledge base and the computational expertise that has been developed over the years, but are putting it at the instrument at the edge in a very different way. Here's another example. This is a robot, again, developed by one of our uh, companies, startups. Now, what we are trying to build is a laser guided. So we need to guide this on the weld to do the inspection. The, there are two ultrasonic probes on either side. And what we are trying to do is do the computation so fast so that we can find out what is wrong with the weld. So on one hand, we want to use this for preventing anything going wrong with the welding. But then sometimes what happens is even a good weld when used over a period of time can actually start to create uh, an aging problem or degradation problem. So you still have to do inspection. So we want to make this robot a very intelligent, edge intelligent robot that will tell the operator not what the problem is, but what the solution is. Can we do that? Finally, all this robotics, all the edge interactions has to have a wider societal impact. So one of our companies, uh, Solinas, is looking at capturing some of the technologies that we develop in the lab, but then trying to solve certain problems that are real and critical and something that we probably overlook on a daily basis. Uh, on the left, what you see here is water from some of the pipes in this city where oil and contaminations mix quite regularly. There are, so how do we make sure that clean water comes to every pipe? Uh, very unfortunately, we also know that 50% of the water that is being supplied do not reach the pipes or they do not reach the taps of uh, uh, the citizens of India, more than 50%. The kind of loss of water is phenomenal given our 
uh, you know condition in uh, cities in india the other second problem as you know very well is well known so in all of this what we are looking at how do we build better sensors how do we include them into the robotics if i have a robot that goes into the uh, pipe that is supplying water to you the water department wants not just to find out what is wrong they also want to say can you fix it can your robot fix it while well, it's inside you already found there's a small problem when you fix it you see that there is a contamination there's there are two pipes next to each other one and they are both uh, sort of uh, inadvertently uh, leaking from one to the other can you go and plug the hole can you fire tell me what uh, what should i do so we are talking about just not exactly uh, finding what is wrong but also trying to intervene and do something about it so in order to do that this company is also we're looking at small what we call a smart uh, what we call as a globus uh, balls or which are robots which are sense which have sensors that will go you can put maybe 20 30 40 100 of them into your pipelines and hopefully they will flow with the flow and be able to give you information send the information uh, and you you should be able to do certain diagnostics and be able to make uh, uh, you know the process of getting simple clean water to your homes a lot more efficient so with that i will conclude by saying that uh, we have a very good ecosystem that's looking at technology differently we would be very excited and we also very much interested in making a small difference in this very complicated world today we are trying to understand nde 4.0 and its potential but i think we have to start working on the future in the future of nde 5.0 as we coined it will be in miniaturization and pervasiveness of sensing and decision making at the edge which is far more intelligent where very complicated calculations can be simplified so that you get a decision and probably intervention along with sensing thank you so much and thank you for listening be happy to take some few questions thank you professor krishnan for that uh, wide ranging and uh, talk uh, showcasing the spectrum of our work so the floor is now open to questions so you can either type in your questions into the chat box or uh, you can raise your hand and uh, we you know we will be calling you up calling out you to have your uh, question so firstly somebody called mr praveen patil has a question can you go ahead mr praveen professor raj ko prabhu i think the question can be typed in and the the question uh, answer box we okay. have disabled the chat box as of now the okay. question can be typed in the the question and answer box okay so uh, that's the decision of the organizer so uh, can you all please type in your questions into the chat box and we will take them as they go along sure uh, so, so i can answer some of these questions i think somebody asked a simple question that i know how the answer for that is what is cnde center for non destructive evaluation so that is the easiest question that i can answer so thank you for asking that question so i can probably go ahead and answer a few questions because typing will take a little bit more time and so, i know we we have a fixed time yeah somebody is asking can you let me know how ndt methods for welding purposes uh, work um yeah i i mean uh there are a number of approaches to looking at uh, welding welding is definitely a, a very large volume problem for non destructive testing now uh, i am not 100% sure uh, i know what iris is uh, so i i i am not clear what iris welding cameras mean uh, because they mean two different things uh, for me but ndt methods are uh, very uh, much uh, uh, employ you know the, the method that are more commonly used are x rays uh, or radiography depending on the thickness of the weld which means it can be gamma ray or uh, iridium or it can be x rays but as they get thicker and thicker it becomes difficult to use uh, x rays 
safety is always an issue so ultrasound is becoming more and more popular in fact the robot with the ultrasound i showed you uses a very new method called fmc tfm uh, for imaging we get much better quality of image and more importantly we get uh, a lot of information that allows us to characterize these defects in the well and more and more we are seeing that this phase array based techniques are becoming a good substitute for x ray based imaging so we are certainly uh, you know be happy uh, to be able to uh, but otherwise please do uh, you, you have my email id do not hesitate to send me an email with some more details so that i can certainly help you with the answers in a more definitive way so somebody is uh, asking gazan for khan is the automation process involved in ndt based on rpa and ui path okay uh, i need to uh, rpa means a lot of things uh, the acronym if, if only it could be uh, if if uh, same with ui is ui means ui user interface or uh, do you recognize what that means so uh, we request this particular person to retype re their question with the details So somebody is asking, how can they pursue a career in NDE after mechanical engineering? I thought I'll. Uh, we have a lot of experts on the call today who can help you with that. But simple depends on what facet of NDT that you want to work in. Do you want to work as a field engineer? Do you want to work as an instrument developer or a technology developer? Do you want to work in R and D? If you want to work in R and D, there are many universities. including iit madras and several other colleges in india that offers a masters and phd program in this field if you want to be a technology developer or then there are many r and d labs that are available that uh, includes isro that includes I, I, uh, dae that includes drdo labs and also certain uh, uh, you know uh, uh, companies uh, like ge uh, and others that have very good r and d labs in this field finally if you want to become a field engineer then you need to take uh, go and get yourself qualified through uh, either the indian society for non district testing or isnt's level 1 level 2 and level 3 prog- uh, certification you can also have a non indian certification in terms of american society for non district testing certification or the british institute certification called the pcn or iso certification these are all available all you need to do is to approach the nearest indian society for non restrictive testing isnt.org or uh, uh, go there and some information is available otherwise send me an email and i will try to connect you next let's go to the next question uh, i am only taking up some significant uh, questions somebody uh, is asking structural uh, assessment techno uh, can we detect material inclusion and corrosion by uh, radiography te- technique in industry okay. uh, again the answer is uh, the question is a little weak but uh, the answer is probably yes uh, we can definitely detect corrosion using x rays and x rays if you do it correctly can also identify to some extent the type of uh, material Prim- primarily x ray depends on the molecular number uh, or the atomic number so it's possible to do that uh, but uh, i need to l- know a little bit more about that information uh, there's mm-hmm. a very interesting question that i saw maybe i will uh, take that question i am a computer science engineering student how can i use ndt the answer is today i say i mean showed you just now lot of it is software lot of it is ai lot of it is data sciences today okay so as a computer science you will have a, a huge application in the field of nde i see another question can nde better be used in space technology very much so it's used uh, almost on a daily basis every single component in fact space is where it's used maximum because although the space may the flight may be only a few minutes to maybe an hour once you light it 
it's you have no recall and once it goes to space there's nobody you know the repairing that is not a, uh, something that's an easy option so you better make it correct so both nasa isro ndt programs are very large and we are always working with both to help them to make sure that every space exploration is safe for anybody who is hum- uh, which are humans as well as people we don't want any of these to fall back into any of our uh, you know uh, communities somebody is asking what ndt techniques can be employed for composite structures so most commonly ultrasonics uh, it's regularly used uh, a secondary technology that is used uh, is uh, infrared imaging but that works only in certain problem sets so the most common is ultrasonics x rays to some extent can be also used but often not used so the most common is ultrasonics for that uh what is the edge robotic decision maker and how does it work so the edge robotics is a phase array based uh, imaging advanced uh, imaging tool but the emphasis on that is to be able to make the robot intelligent so that it knows that where the weld is it tracks the position of the weld make sure that you get the right data and then processes the data and while it's processing the data it also has the ability to compute intelligently using the physics based models that we have all been developing over the years and to be able to come and recommend uh intervention or what to do uh, to that operator who's doing that today the information goes to somewhere else and then very intelligent people make the you know do a lot of calculation then come back maybe after one day two day five days and say this is what you need to do so we're going to try to cut short that lead time somebody is asking uh, can we have a measure of reliability of nd 5.0 techniques uh, i think 5.0 technique is a little uh, uh, early to do it but definitely on nd technologies reliability is a major component of that okay and hence uh, there is a lot of and I, in fact i see a vamshi krishna okay i know who vamshi krishna relenta is from germany so he is talking about uh, pod curves and all that so there is a lot of reliability in fact there is a talk by or uh, there was a talk by vamshi and his colleague uh, about a week or so ago on exactly this topic uh, uh, there is a webinar by him and his colleague so it is possible to do that uh, but there's a lot of effort to do that again a lot of the computational resources that we have can actually help may sh- shorten the process and make it more affordable so one mr setty suresh is asking is there any significance of radio frequency sensing in nd 5.0 or is it outdated no no it's not at all outdated in fact very interestingly the one of the newer methods in the last 10 to 15 years is something called terahertz now prior to that and even very relevant to that is uh, using rf waves often they can also be called as millimeter waves or microwaves exactly the same thing as used in your cell phone for communication but at maybe at different frequencies so we can use this because they will penetrate non conducting materials so fiberglass uh, materials plastic materials many materials where an ultrasound and sometimes even x rays have difficulty this uh, part of the uh, spectrum works very well in fact kavita arnachalam who works in our center is uh, very well known in this area in this area now interestingly if you go from that in the micro, if you look at the your good old uh, uh, you know uh, high school uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum it will not show something in between a microwave and a infrared so when you travel that you go from microwave to infrared somewhere in between there is a small band and today we call it the terahertz today terahertz is used in many too many ways to say you know talk about right from simple application like measuring paint thickness of your mercedes car 
all the way to making sure that the letter that you receive does not have anything bad in it. Okay, so they are using it to scan. In fact, in US, almost all official letters to the government of US is scanned using a terahertz thing. Today, they are also using it to scan chocolates because of uh, contaminants in chocolates. So, so terahertz is sort of a, an RF, uh, but at the edge of the RF going towards uh, infrared. So somebody is asking, how could we use AI and sensors in the field of civil engineering? So as I said, civil engineering is one of the very interesting problems where the problem sets are large. You, go, you got bridges, you have dams that are so big that honestly, even to walk from one end to the other and you know go up and down, it's not easy. So one of the best ways to do it is to instrument these. How to instrument these? You got to make sure that these are, uh, uh, yeah, and the data that you can you get from them is going to be huge. And that's where AI will come in. How do you process a big data, big data analytics, using AI to do these data analytics? That is where you have the challenges and the opportunities. Somebody is asking uh, some examples of live structural health monitoring for challenging location and also some examples of acoustic waves in NDE. Okay, oh, that's uh, So uh, I, I would say the common answer can be that uh, today it is possible to use acoustic waves either as a, 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 just as a listening device. And so this is done uh, in large uh, uh, containers, uh, what they call a storage tanks, where today by just putting sensors around that storage tank, which contains uh, crude oil or can ha have very corrosive materials, actually you can listen and people claim that they can listen to the bacteria in the oil actually interacting with the metal and creating what is the bio corrosion. That is, it's actually eating the metal to survive. All right. And you can listen to that and be able to do that. Another example I will show you, this is many years ago, I saw this. They're actually using acoustics to actually find a single beetle in a huge ball, you know, a container. This container is like uh, maybe 20 meters high and two meters in diameter. This is how in US they storage, store grains, like wheat and all that. They can find that a single beetle eating at a grain and they can locate it and they have a robotic arm that goes and takes a bit of, you know, grabs it and throws it out. So these are very interesting structural health monitoring type of application, which are quite, uh, you know, unusual. But then we do have many other, uh, today people are talking about a lot of uh, aerospace structures. Today we are talking of rails. In fact, Indian Railways is looking at using acoustic sensors to actually send and receive ultrasonic waves in rails and be able to cover about two kilometers of the rail in a structural health monitoring so that if there's a rail crack, we want to know that well before a train goes over it. So that's a, that's a very good example. And Indian Railways is actually looking at it very carefully. So Mr. Dinakaran is asking, what NDT could you propose for measuring temperature of an emissive and moving object? Example, steel rolled in a hot mill at 800 degrees centigrade. I just have a PhD student who just graduated, who has shown it work uh, exactly for something very similar. Um, uh, but at um, uh, I think we have gone up to 600 or 650 degrees C, but I don't see why it cannot be done at 800. The only reason we stopped at 600 is because uh, we couldn't generate uh, temperature higher than that in our lab. Um, so we can do that with a slight change. So instead of using a passive uh, thermography, we use an active thermography, wherein we use laser to excite, and wherein the emissivity becomes less of an issue. And so, we, uh, so there is a way by which we can calculate that. So it's emiss in fact, we even do this uh, with the scale. In fact, whenever there's a scale on top, which you will probably find at the 800 degrees Celsius on steel, we do better than without scale. Just recently, I, I mean, in fact, the thesis is not yet accepted, 
So I would be happy to share the the work with you if you can send me an email. The email ID is on the screen right now. My email ID. So Vamsi Krishna is again asking, and this is uh, something that we have pondered over as well. So what are this? You know what is NDE five point zero, and how is it diff? You know more advantageous from NDE four point zero. So uh, I mean, uh, so the transition of these terminologies are quite arbitrary. So uh, somebody decided to call something industry 4.0, and so so we call it 4.0, and uh, it first found acceptance. So ND 4.0 is something that we are trying to get a handle on today. We have some ideas, but we still haven't completely figured it out. So it is even more uh, ambitious to say I know what ND 5.0 is going to look like. So we are making some educated guesses where ND 5.0 can go. Towards, which is the five paradigms which we talked about, but I don't see this limited to those five paradigms. I'm sure three years from now or five years from now, I'm going to come up with a different list, and we're going to find out together what ND 5.0 is going to have in store for us. We still have to figure out what ND 4.0 is going to offer to us completely. That is that still it remains to be seen, but 5.0 we believe will have paradigm change. in the way we look at problems the way we look at solutions the way we look at computation the way we look at sensors uh the sensors have to be smaller the sensors have to be more intelligent the sensors have to not only think uh, not only see not only think but also find out what is wrong and probably do something about it. these are things that will probably evolve so nd4 5.0 is something which i think will become more apparent uh, probably 8 to 10 to 11 years from now somebody is asking can nd play a crucial role in earthquake prone areas or disaster prone areas like uttarakhand uh yes sir no nd is already playing some role uh, but not to the extent which uh, you probably wanted to so uh one of the problems with uh, this is the fact that the earth uh, crust while we have some idea about the earth crust and nd methods are used to map the earth crust this is done using very very low frequency uh, in fact uh, subsonic uh, technologies so in some ways if you call that as nde although we conventionally don't categorize that as nde we are doing nde of substructure and that will help us to understand the earth's uh, make and uh, do that the other thing i did mention was if i you have very fast computers and ability to model and calculate uh, you know things very fast uh, then probably and uh, and anybody who understands earthquakes will understand that earthquake is not a single wave okay earthquake has multiple waves that travel and usually the faster wave mode comes early the slower wave mode comes later but the slower wave mode is the one that causes most of the damage so the difference in time between the fast and the slow could be anywhere from few seconds to maybe tens of seconds depending on how far you are away from the source so there has been a lot of speculation can i use and today the liability is the speed at which we can compute if i can do it fast enough then i can take some preventive action i mean especially quickly shut down or start the shutdown of nuclear power plants so that we don't have a fukushima again you know uh, do a few things that might actually uh, uh, help us so there are potential uh, applic uh, things now we do uh, use nde significantly to ensure safety of these structures that have been affected by uh, uh earthquakes that has happened well so nd will qualify what uh, buildings to bring down and what buildings should not be brought down somebody is asking can we integrate uh, water pipeline robots with sensors to detect water purity i suspect it should be possible Which, uh, i don't see why it cannot be possible a very i would say that is a fairly uh, low hanging fruit so uh, this is 
entering into gray area but i think it should be addressed somebody is asking uh, in india unemployability is the measure so how what is the impact of this technology in industry so i, I think we are creating jobs in yeah. india we are creating jobs in india i just mentioned that we have in just through our startups we have created 500 jobs now the indian society for non destructive testing trains people in level 1 level 2 level 3 okay some of the, at level 1 you need to be only uh, i think a, a high school graduate okay and i i i don't know exactly how many we do per year but i would say in and and this is just not done by indian society of ndt there are other private organizations that do the same so only in india we are probably creating few thousand jobs every year through this training program and most of them get jobs in india in the industry and also if you go to middle east or you go to southeast asia in this field there hardly anybody but indians who work on this field okay so it is dominated by indians in in, in a big uh, you know section of the world so we are creating a significant uh, value addition employment both at, at different levels uh, mr jitendra bharadwaj wants to know what technologies can be used for internal body uh, organ inspection in real time so that comes in the biomedical imaging uh, field uh, plenty of things are done today the only technology that we don't use that is used very significantly by the medical community is uh, mri or magnetic resonance image the magnetic resonance imaging uses hydrogen atoms for imaging unfortunately lot of our problem set does not have hydrogen atoms uh, and there's a reason why they say please remove all your metallic pieces from your body uh, to do mri or if you have a implant they can't do an mri because metals create too much uh, interference so a lot of what we do is meta, uh, has metal in it so mri is one thing that we don't do uh, in nd but pretty much every other technology is used in nd and for human body the same ultrasound the same x ray the same infrared imaging uh, magnetic resonance imaging all are used on a daily basis all you need to do is walk into one of your clinics down the road from your where you live and you see all these technologies available at uh, a price to you so mr balaji gopinath is asking and i think again it's relevant to what we have done is uh, we've been using conventional radiography for castings walls and la- large body castings for more than 3 decades how can we progress towards automation in this area um yeah, again automation is always possible no matter what the technology is so automation involves robotics if you do want to go that route automation also involves data analysis both are possible today we are uh, converting lot of the conventional non destructive testing methods like uh, magnetic particle inspection fluorescent in- penetrant inspection we are changing the paradigm there and we are uh, basically looking at uh, how do we automate these processes because today there's pressure on manufacturing and the volume of manufacturing is, is quite severe so we got to make it faster we got to make it more reliable and the cost of missing on anything uh, any detection is quite high so so we are automating every single process vision is another way by using cameras we are capturing a lot of uh, issues today that we didn't do maybe 10 years 20 years ago so automation is can be done on anything that you want it to be done there is a cost associated with it that you have to handle but often the long term payoffs are much much higher so the it's always a business decision to go this route somebody is asking is it possible to apply ai itself in sensors like ai in chip i believe so so uh, i i i see at the end of the day ai is uh, something that works on digital platforms so 
so ai is a computational software tool but if it, it definitely works on small uh, chips and the chips can be integrated into a sensor because most sensors do have some form of electronics to convert uh, whatever data that you get in analog form into some form of digital technology so it's definitely possible to add on to it i don't think we have yet we have very powerful chips that can do at at a, a small enough form factor but that's definitely coming to so another 2 3 years down the road i'm sure you get very tiny chips which are as powerful as some of the large chips that are available today so i'm sure there is a future for that okay uh, so rudramurthy says that uh, we are uh, out of time yeah so i think we have answered a wide range of questions so just the last question here is somebody is asking can you detect cracks on roadways while moving with traffic at absolutely uh, absolutely we can do that in fact i right now i know a couple of my students are working on a problem but not for iit but for a uh, company uh, exactly what what they asking but they using vision so this is something that uh, your eye can see but can you do it and use ai to do it and do it at speeds of a uh, of a moving vehicle the answer is it's possible today so that's it uh, thank, thank you. you so much uh, all of you so, yeah, professor krishnan if you have some thank final... you thank you very much to the global engagement and iit matras for giving us this opportunity and thank you rudra and thank you prabhu for a fantastic moderation and my apologies we couldn't get to all the questions my apologies uh, we'll see if we can find the answer questions and see if we can uh, find the way to answer it back if not uh, please do not hesitate to send an email to me as i said again my email id is right there on the screen feel free to send an email to me and i will definitely answer back within 24 hours thank you very much have a safe safe day and a safe uh, environment we 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 want everybody to stay safe thank you all have a good evening thank you uh, once again i would like to thank you professors for taking the the time to uh, make people aware about our researches and way way forward so to all the participants the next webinar will be on 20th of july so please visit our website for more information and the webinar this webinar will be available on the iit matters youtube handle looking forward to meet you everyone in the next webinar thanks again for joining thank you professors thank you thank you sir thank you professor sir thank you thank you very, very nice much professor. very nice thank you. presentation sir this is tangamani sir I I I recognize your voice. I recognize your voice. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, sir. You have such a lovely you. voice. We know we can figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. Thank you, sir. Thank Glad you, sir. you could participate. Yeah. Thank you. Very much informative, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, all of you. Take care. Thank you, Richu. Thank you, Professor Krishna. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Marish you can proceed to uh, with the show